So we are bound to worry that some of you might seem to have missed out on God's promise of entering his rest, the promise which is still open before us. For we certainly have the good news announced to us, just as they did. But the word which they heard didn't do them any good, because they were not united in faith with those who heard it. For it is we who believe who entered into the rest. As it has been said, as I swore in my anger, they will never enter my rest, even though God's works had been completed since the foundation of the world. For it says this somewhere about the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again, in the present passage, they will never enter my rest. Thus we conclude, there is still a future Sabbath rest for God's people. Anyone who enters that rest will take a rest from their works as God did from his. I thank God because of your love and faith which you have toward Jesus and toward each other and that you are sharing your faith and that it might become more effective by acknowledging of every good thing which is for you and in you in Christ Jesus. May God's grace and peace be yours from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Bernie was an elder in my church at Escondido. Bernie loved to come into the office to share something with us from time to time. And at that office, it was a very small one, there was, you opened the door and just to the left as you opened it was the copy machine and then to the very immediate right was the secretary's desk. And so one day he came in, I was at the copy machine, and Bernie had a big smile on his face and said, Pastor Gary, guess what? And I said, well, I don't know, Bernie, what? And he said, I went to a seminar this weekend, and I learned that we're not saved by what we do, we're saved by what Jesus has done. And I said, oh, really, Bernie, tell me more. You see, back in the early 80s, a lot of us were talking about righteousness by faith. We didn't mention grace or mercy a lot. Those precede being righteous by faith, right, and continue on. But we would just talk about righteousness by faith. And I've been preaching on that for a long time, and when he said I learned that we're saved by what Jesus has done. My secretary kind of, you know, did this. And I just listened to him and let him share. And it just reminded me of something very important. That just because we hear something once doesn't mean we've caught on to it. And just because we've learned something doesn't mean we've been convicted of it. And God knows who we are and where we're at, and he knows what we need at the present moment. And we all grow, just as we did physically, we all grow spiritually at different ways at different times. And we need to remind each other of that from time to time. I'm going to begin my message today by recapping a sermon I did two weeks ago. Because there are some here who weren't here for that, and we really need to understand what that's all about. And there are some online who haven't seen it yet either. Two weeks ago, I, this message was wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And we talked about the fact that when Jesus was sending out his disciples with a rather unpopular message that he was indeed the Messiah, although he wasn't the Messiah that they were expecting, even though the disciples didn't understand that completely either. And so he sent them out and he gave them, told them that they, as they gave the message of Jesus being the one bringing God's kingdom to the earth, that they needed to be wise as serpents, smart in how they presented it, harmless as dove, gentle in how they presented that unpopular message. And I applied that to the three angels' messages, especially the first one. And the question becomes, how, how do we do that? How do we apply the message of the three angels in a gentle way, in a wise way? I reminded you those a couple weeks ago that just as in baseball there is spring training to cover the basic principles of, of baseball, that you don't start out just knowing all the rules, you don't start out knowing how, all the skills, that you have to have that, that, those skills learned. And they must always be there even as you grow stronger and bigger. We talked about education at, 
the reading, writing, and arithmetic of years gone by, that you can't advance on to higher education if you don't have uh, basic reading, writing, and arithmetic down. And then we went to architecture. And we said that in a tall skyscraper, unless you have a solid foundation, the details of the building won't matter. Because unless there's a solid foundation, a strong foundation, the details can all collapse. And so, I've mentioned that when we talk about the three angels' messages, that we need to first model the basics of the three angels' message. We need to teach the basic principles before we get to the details. Because without a proper foundation, the details will be destroyed. We talked about the fact that there were three basic principles of the three angels. The first one is, was that uh, the first basic principle is that the everlasting gospel defines the rest of the message. The rest of the message doesn't define it. And the everlasting gospel, and there's still some papers out in the foyer if you didn't get it, is about the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, intercession of Jesus in heaven and his second coming. We talked about the fact that Jesus must be the center of the message. It can't just be about details. And we also talked about the fact that there are basic principles in each message. And so today, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, that, um, there's one more thing, the first angel's message. We also saw that the first angel's message had four imperatives. They are a synopsis of the first four commandments. Fear God, give glory to him, the hour of his judgment has come, not taking his name in vain, saying we're Christians but living like the rest of the world. We are to worship him who made heaven, earth, and the seas, referring to both the Sabbath and also to, to God as creator. But today, we are going to look at the second and third three angels' messages. Because in reality, not only is the everlasting gospel a thread that goes through all three messages, but worship is a thread that goes through all three messages as well. Worship is the result of receiving the everlasting gospel. And so today we're going to look first at the basic principles of the second angel's message. Then another angel, a second angel followed, declaring, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink of the maddening wine of her passionate unchastity or idolatry. Now, if you're not familiar with the Amplified Version, the Amplified Version will put brackets or parentheses around certain words because translating from one language to another, any language, one word sometimes doesn't cover it all. And so you look at perhaps, that's why we have different Bible translations that help us. And so the Amplified sometimes puts some words in bracket to help us understand it more. In this message, as Adventists, we have tried to rush to identify who is Babylon that has fallen. We want to make sure we, we identify who that institution or who that group of people are. And there is a point to that. But when we do that, we do it without understanding what Babylon really symbolizes. What, are the, what is the key characteristic of Babylon? When we do that, we minimize the scope of how broad Babylon might be. We also minimize the fact that there, and do not understand the root of Babylon that goes back in Bible time. And so we want to look at the roots of the characteristics of Babylon. And the roots of the characteristic of Babylon are found in Genesis 11. Now the context of that, you remember, is there was a worldwide flood. And God put a rainbow in the sky to promise that he would never destroy the earth by flood again. And as the world population grew and increased, years later, they looked around, the flood was still engraved in their memory, told, passed on, generation by generation. And they determined that they weren't going to fall prey to the flood again. So rather than saying, I'm not going to fall prey to the flood again, I'm going to rely on God's promises, they said, we know what we'll do. They said in Genesis 11, verse 4, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. The basic characteristics of Babylon are found in the story. The basic uh, characteristic of Babylon is Babylon does not trust what God says. Babylon trusts what they say. 
Babylon is relying on what they could do, not what God could do. Babylon is relying on its own promises or its own boasts of its own accomplishments and not relying on what God said and what God will do. The second root of Babylon is found in the story of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. And remember, Daniel, or Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And he dreamed about this big tall tree that grew and birds of the air came and flocked into it and then suddenly it was cut down and destroyed. And he asked Daniel to come and help him interpret the dream and Daniel said he was that tall tree and that he would be cut down and lose his place as king of the of of the empire and a year later this is what says took place Daniel 4 verse 29 at the end of 12 months he Nebuchadnezzar was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon and the king said Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my own mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? And he was sent out to live for seven years in the field. Now, did you notice his emphasis? And do you notice what it's similar to? Does it remind you of another story in in Isaiah where Lucifer, the star of the morning, said, I will ascend to heaven, I will be like God. The roots go that far back. I want you to notice that Nebuchadnezzar standing there, and, and God had told him through Daniel that he was the head of gold because God had placed him there. But he refused to listen to God's promises, and instead, instead, He decided that he was going to take glory for himself. It would be about his own accomplishments. His pride, his pride got in the way of him seeing God at work. There's an interesting statement by Ellen White in Patriarchs and Prophets. She says that nearly every false religion has been based on the same principle that man can depend upon his own efforts for salvation. Every false religion has been based on the same principle that man can depend upon his own efforts for salvation. I want you to notice, and I can't read it from back there, but notice the quote by Spurgeon. The greatest enemy, no, one back. The greatest enemy to human souls is the self-righteous spirit which makes men look to themselves for salvation the greatest enemy to our souls. And in the human nature, there is this desire somehow, some way, our sinful nature desires to try and save ourselves, to accomplish what only God can accomplish in us and through us. One of my mentors, Morris Benden, in his book On Common Ground, put it another way. In this message of the second angel, we are reminded of what happens to Babylon. It falls. The idea that you can save yourself fell a long time ago. The second angel reminds us that Babylon and our own glory and worshiping ourselves are all fallen. We have inherent in this message a warning against trying to earn salvation by our own works and an invitation to the salvation that comes by faith alone in Jesus. I think he identifies a very important point. And that very important point is this. You don't have to be in the institution Babylon to experience or to be in Babylon. Every false religion is based on trying to save yourself. The principle of secularism, which is a religion, whether people admit it or not, secularism is man trying to save himself from the evils around doesn't matter which religion you choose. Buddhism is man trying to save themselves. Hinduism is man trying to save himself. Islam is man trying to save himself. Judaism is man trying to save himself. Catholicism is man trying to save himself. Protestantism is man... Now, when I say man trying to save himself, I'm saying there are people in there who are trying to save themselves. Not everybody, okay? I need to clarify that. And I should have said, in Buddhism, in Hinduism, there are people who are trying to save themselves. In Islam, in the evangelicalism, among the evangelical world, 
there are people who are trying to save themselves. And yes, even in Adventism, there are people who are trying to save themselves. And it is a false religion. We cannot save ourselves. Only Jesus could save us. Only Jesus could save us. You don't have to be in the identified institution of Babylon to experience and be part of Babylon. If you think there's something you must do to prove to God how worthy you are or to save yourself, our only salvation comes in Jesus. I want you to notice the basics of the first angel is calling people back to God. The basics of the second angel is that we are being saved by God. What does that mean? What does that mean? We're going to look at the principles now of the third angel's message. Revelation 14, 9 to 11. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his, its image and receives a mark on his forehead or in his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and suffer in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rose up forever and ever. Now we usually focus on that part of this passage when we give the third angel's message. We want to identify the beast in his image. We want to identify what is the wine of the wrath. And, all, and we should do that. But that's not the basic element of the third angel's message. The basic element is found in the last part of verse 11. Notice what it says. They have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast in its image, and whoever receives the mark or the seal of its name. The issue in the third angel's message is, are you receiving rest? Are you having rest and peace in your relationship with God? Are you experiencing the rest that only Jesus can give? Or are you unsure of your salvation? Are you unsure of your standing with God? I, I want to point out something before we move on. What does it mean to experience rest? What is the Sabbath rest that we talk about as Adventist? Because usually we, we talk about this message as you've got to be worshiping on the right day in the right way. You've got to keep the right day in the right way. Is there more to it than that? And I think there is. I, I want you to notice what the idea of rest is in the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at Hebrews 4, 1 to 5 and verse 9. But prior to that, in the book of Hebrews, the author uses the illustration of Joshua and the people of Israel entering the promised land. And they were to enter the promised land based on the promise of God that he would fight the battles for them, that he would give them that promised land. And that worked out with the first battle at Jericho, remember? But then when they saw other things and they thought, well, Ai is smaller than Jericho. We can take that. And they didn't ask God about it. They didn't depend on him. They were resting in their own abilities. And, and Hebrews uses this as an example of what it means to rest in God because the book of Hebrews talks about the fact that Jesus is better than angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the law. Jesus is better than the sacrificial system. Jesus is what... The Christian life is all about. And we need, we must, rest in what he has done, not what we've done. And so after using the example of, of Joshua and the children of Israel trying to enter the promised land on their own strength and power, this is what he writes. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we have believed, who have believed enter the rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above he says, They shall never enter my rest. Therefore there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There remains a Sabbath rest. 
It's resting in the promises of God. It's resting in what God can accomplish in and through us and not we can accomplish on our, on our own. We quickly want to go to the details without looking at the basic premise of the third angel's message. And the basic premise is, if you aren't resting in the completed work of God in creation, if you aren't resting in the completed work of God in salvation, you aren't resting regardless of what day you keep. Period. Ellen White has a, a message. Has a, uh, there's a quote. And some may say to me, Pastor Gary, wait a minute. It sounds like it's not you're holding back on the message of the three angels. I don't believe so. I'm talking about the basic principle behind a message. If we go to the details first, it's like a building whose foundation is weak. They will collapse. We must present the basics first. This is what Ellen White said. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. The prophet declares, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Brightness, glory, and power are to be connected with the third angel's message. And conviction will follow wherever it is preached in demonstration of the Spirit. I have a little bit longer quote, too long to put on the screen from Morris Vendon in his book, On Common Ground, from page 18. Listen carefully to what he says. He says, I'm going to take the position that there is something far deeper here. I'm going to take the position that anyone, church member or heathen, who does not know what it means to come to Jesus for rest day by day, and who does not give top priority to his time with God, is on the road to receiving the mark of the beast and worshiping his image, regardless of of how well-informed he may be about prophecy and theology. On the other hand, anyone who listens to the messages of the three angels and gives all glory to God instead of glorifying himself and depending on his own attempts to save himself is on the road to receiving the seal of God. This is the basic message of all three angels, a warning against trying to save oneself, a warning against living life independent of God, a warning against counting anything else important, except our personal oneness and fellowship with Jesus Christ. This is the message that will circle the world before the end of time. I think he's absolutely right. Absolutely right. I want to share with you a startling statistic. The world population as of the end of 2022 was 8 million people. Seventh-day Adventist church membership was 22,234,406. Two the percentage of Adventists in the world to the world population is 0. .0028. That should be startling. Now, if you think about it, that's the membership on the books. If you were to count the number of active members who attend regularly it would be far less worldwide. And if you were to count the number of members who are actively involved in sharing the good news of the gospel with other people who don't know Jesus yet, the percentage would be minimal. It's already minimal. It would be super minimal. That should startle us. I want to remind you of something that Dr. Kidder said last week because we could easily fall into despair. How in the world are we going to give the message? Doc, remember, Dr. Kidder stated that the best way that people are converted to Jesus, the way most people are converted to Jesus is through family and friends who share Jesus with them. It's not through media. It's not through pastors. It's not through evangelists, although evangelists help bring people in that you have brought in, if you will. If we are going to share the message of the three angels with the world, God's going to have to do something spectacular if it's only about us. And what I'm going to say next may startle some of you, but I think we need to keep a reality check. How will 3% or less of the, wor of the world's population reach the world for Jesus? Humanly speaking, it's an impossibility. 
But there are three reasons that you and I can have hope. The first is the divine element. It says the angels are flying in the midst of heaven. They're not walking around on the earth. We point out that the angels are human messengers giving a message, and that's true. But it needs to be not just a message about information. It needs to be a message about a relationship with God. I, I want you to, to notice that the angels are flying in the midst of heaven because God wants us to recognize that there is a divine element to the pro proclamation of this message. Do, do you see that? I would remind you of what took place at Pentecost shortly after the ascension of Jesus. They're in the upper room, and there's 120 disciples at that moment. And then God pours out his spirit, and 3,000 are converted in one day. Another 2,000 later on, and the word spread. It's going to take a divine miracle of God to proclaim the message in a way that people will hear it. The second thing I want you to notice is that we are not alone in proclaiming the message. Now that may sound strange. You may think I'm a heretic. I'll stand on this premise. Remember the story of Elijah? Remember the story of Elijah? The next slide, please. Elijah went and had that contest about Baal, remember? And he said, if Baal is God, follow him. If God is God, follow him. And he wins the victory, and the fire comes down, and then he runs pell-mell down the mountain. And he falls asleep, and in the morning he hears that Jezebel has said, I'm going to kill you. You killed my prophets. I'm going to kill you. And he runs scared. And he ends up in a cave on Mount Sinai. And while he's there, there's lightning and thunder and fire and a strong wind, and God's not in those things. But it says God's in a still, small voice. And God asked him the question, where are you, Elijah? Why are you here, Elijah? Why are you, my prophet, here in this place by yourself? You can't minister here. Why are you here? And Elijah says, well, I, I became afraid for my own life. Jezebel threatened to kill me, and I'm the only one now who worships you. And what was God's response? There are 7,000 left who have not bowed their, their knee to idolatry. 7,000 left who still worship me. 7,000 left that you don't know about who are following me. There are many people, solid Christian people, who are in other churches, in other denominations, who are following God to the best of their ability. They not, may not be convicted of some things you and I are convicted, but you and I cannot tell when someone has just heard something or when someone has been convicted of something. There's a total difference. Remember the story at the beginning about my friend Bernie? Someone else had to convict him. And you know what? That happens often. Most of us do not accept something we hear the first time. We want it, need to be convicted of it, especially spiritually. There are people who are calling people back to God in other churches. And they're reaching people. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but there are a number of people who are calling people to accept the Seventh-day Sabbath. They may not be part of our denomination, but they are starting to proclaim the, Sa the Sabbath day more completely. There are those who worship on Sunday, and they are talking about the fact that we need to have our worship more than just the time we spend in church and then go on as if worshiping God doesn't matter the rest of the time. There's some fantastic articles about what Sabbath means that are available out there. Am I suggesting that Sabbath doesn't matter? No. Am I suggesting the details of the three angels doesn't matter? No. I'm, suggest I'm not just suggesting. I firmly believe, I firmly believe that if we do not give the message of the three angels with the basic message first and foremost that we are calling people back to God, we are calling people to recognize they are saved by what Jesus done, not their own works. And they, they are to rest or trust in Jesus as they continue to grow in him. If all we can talk about are the details, those details do collapse around us. Finally, I want you to notice the concluding statement of the three angels' message. 
It's found in James chapter 14, verse 12. Again, in the Amplified Version. Here comes in a call, or here comes in a call for the steadfastness of the saints, their patience, the endurance of the people of God. Those who habitually keep God's commandments and their faith in Jesus. That word keep is interesting. It's often translated obey, and, and that's part of it. it. But it comes from the military realm. It's the idea of guarding and keeping and holding on to the fort. Holding on to your position. It's about honoring. And sometimes, as Adventists, we say we keep all ten commandments. No, we don't. We break them all the time. Right? Let's be honest. We honor all ten. We hold them in high value. And there are many in other churches who are living up to the light they know and have been convicted of. But I want you to notice the last phrase. They keep God's commandments and their faith is in Jesus. You and I cannot determine who has faith in Jesus and who does not. We can't read people's motives. We can't do that for people inside this church. We can't do that for people who are outside the Adventist church. Only God can do that. One thing I believe, that we believe that the final events will be rapid ones. We believe that God will cut his work short in righteousness. And if God chooses to bring about many, many people coming together from different faiths to believe together what he's asked us to believe, that's up to the Spirit to do that work. Our job, our job is to call people back to God. Our job is to invite people to depend on Jesus for salvation. Our job is to invite people to experience the rest that Jesus invited you and I to when he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's an invitation we can gladly give to the world. And when they do, as God leads, that will give us the opportunity to go through the details of what we believe in this passage. But the details must always be with the awareness that it's all about God and it's not about us. It's letting God do his work in people's lives, in his time, in his way, and allowing the spirit to convict because you and I cannot do that work. I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel to proclaim to all people, fear God, give glory to him, hour of his judgment has come and worship him who is your creator who is your redeemer and who is your friend